is what we refer to as Palm Sunday. And as I mentioned a few weeks ago, we actually read the passage that's Palm Sunday, what, three weeks ago now or so, a few weeks ago. And so I guess mentally we kind of have to make the shift, right? But it also helps us to understand um, that as we've been reading through the book of Mark, chapter 11 happens today, essentially. And then all of these chapters between 11 and 16 happen this week, between now and next Sunday. So it kind of gives us a, a perspective on what's happening in these last few chapters of Mark and how they're really compressed together and how Mark is really focusing a lot of his attention on just one week worth of time, right? And so um, welcome. I'm glad you're here for this Palm Sunday, and I hope you brought your Bible. Um, as we've journeyed through Mark, today we're in chapter 14. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. And um, we, uh, our, our focus today or the subject of, of today is um, communion, is the Passover meal. And so that's really going to be um, our focus uh, today. We're going to uh, be looking at chapter 14, but I'm just going to let you know we're going to stop um, up at the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is about halfway through. Um, and I just want to have you turn there quickly. Um, verse 32 is where that section starts. Um, because we, we get this very interesting scene in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I, see, I'm not going to dive deep because we're going to talk about it Friday night as well. But here we are in the garden. We have Jesus praying and his three closest friends and disciples sleeping. Kind of an interesting scene, isn't it? And I've, until I really studied into this a few years ago, I can't tell you how often I thought to myself, what's wrong with these guys? Like, why are they sleeping? And of course, we know the whole story, right? We know what's going to happen in the hours to come. And I'm sitting here thinking, how can these guys be sleeping? But today, I want us to, to think about that. Like, why are these guys sleeping? And now I want us to back up to the beginning of chapter 14, and we're going to find out why. We're going to see why it is they're sleeping. And there's actually really great legitimate reasons as to why they're sleeping. Okay. So we have the, the garden and uh, now we come back to the beginning of chapter 14. And um, Mark begins with two verses sort of clarifying something we've already talked about. And that is that the, the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders are pretty committed to killing Jesus. This commitment has been long standing and now has increased over the last few days. And if you just mentally go back the last few chapters, um, we, we see why, right? We see why their commitment level has ramped up and their timeline has ramped up because of what he has done the last few days. He has really asserted himself and he has really made them mad in turn, right? And so their commitment to killing him has risen significantly. And, and this gives us a couple um, little hints we need to, to think about, and that they said, yes, we, we need to kill. Must be careful. Okay, I disappeared for a second. We must be careful because it is Passover. And the crowds really like Jesus. And so they know they have to be careful when and how they're going to kill him. And so this reminds us, remember what season it is for them. Remember the, the festival and the time of year it is, and that's the Passover season. And we're going to talk more about that as we go through because that plays a huge role in what we're going to talk about. But just think back the last few weeks as, we, as we've talked about the environment there in Jerusalem with the, the Passover. Jerusalem was a town of about 50,000 people, and it's estimated that during Passover it, blo it blossomed up to over 150. 50,000 people. So picture our community with three times as many people here that normally are. 
Okay, just the hustle, the bustle. Now you picture it being a smaller place um, in terms of like the streets and things like that. Houses closer together. There's not the windows and those sort of things. So you can hear the commotion of the family down the alleyway and the, the 10 extra people they have and the, the excitement and all the joy of having family and at the market and, and people coming and, and literally rubbing shoulders with each other and far more than, than normally are there. You just picture the excitement of what's happening around the city. And so the, the, the religious leaders, in spite of their commitment to killing him, they know they must be careful. And so this is sort of a a narrative point that Mark makes, and then we come to verse 3. And verse 3 says, now while Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, reclining at the table, and I want to stop there just to touch base with a couple things we've talked about. Bethany remembers a few miles east. That's where he's based out of these last few days, and he's going into Jerusalem and then back out and then in Jerusalem and back out. And so he's out in Bethany. He's eating with, um, at the house of a man named Simon the leper. Okay, the leper. That means one of the outcasts. Remember, one of the the folks that society doesn't want, but Jesus has been very consistent in all of his ministry and that these are the people he is spending the time with. And right here, up until the last hours of his life, he is still there. He is is eating at all the wrong people's tables. And then he is reclining, and that, that is the position they would eat in, not like we do, okay? So he's eating a meal at somebody's house where, according to society and all expectations of Messiah, he should not be at, but he is, and that's where he intends to be and where he wants to be. And so while they're there, while they're reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar. Now, the, impre- the impression here is that she interrupts, that she wasn't one of the invited guests, okay? That she, she comes in, and she has an alabaster jar of costly aromatic oil from pure nard. Okay, now I did some looking on this because this is all foreign to me, right? An alabaster jar is a very precious jar. It's not a normal clay pot. It's a very precious jar. And the, the, um, the uh, costly oil that's inside it is an oil that is imported from India. Okay, now picture importing from India today. And now how much harder would it have been 2,000 years ago? Okay, so this is a, uh, an oil that was imported from there and it has a mixture of myrrh in with it. Okay, and so here she comes in with this super expensive oil in this very unique and, and important jar, okay, in terms of its substance and, it, and its purpose is to carry important things. So here she interrupts the dinner and she comes in and it says, after breaking the jar open, Now, I don't know what your translation says, but everybody I read about this isn't like she broke it open like like she's breaking the seal, but she broke the jar. Okay, she just ruined the jar. She broke it open, and it says she poured it on his head. So what I picture is she came in and like taking the, the neck of it at the top or something, like breaking it off, and then taking the oil and pouring it onto Jesus' head. This is kind of unique, right? And you picture if you're at a dinner party and somebody uninvited comes in and does this, right? You're, you're going to be like, what? What's happening, right? Who is this lady? And she, she, broke, she broke the jar. And it's expensive stuff. And you can imagine the, the aroma, the smell would just be filling the house, right? Well, <clears throat> what, she, what we need to make certain of here, and I want to see this contrast, is that she is all in. Like she, she broke the jar. She didn't, you know, screw the lid off, pour a little out, pour it, screw it back on, put it away for another time, right? Like she's all in. She broke the jar. She is completely committed to whatever it is she is doing and meaning to do. She is all in. And we see this in contrast, if you think back through the book of Mark, of all the people who were not all in, who were not fully committed, who said they were until the rubber had to meet the road, and then they said, no, thank you. And they backed out. And we also see this in contrast to another woman, just a chapter and a touch more back, and the widow with her might, with her small amount of money that she put into the offering. And as everyone looked on, they saw a woman giving very little, but in reality, she was all in. She was giving all she had, right? We see these little examples dropped in, these themes throughout this, and this is a really beautiful example of this woman who is all in, For Jesus. And so, verse 4 but there were some who were present who were indignant. 
and said to one another, why this waste of expensive ointment? It could have been sold for more than 300 silver coins and the money given to the poor. And so they spoke angrily to her. Okay, now these, these were the uh, financially responsible ones of the bunch. These were the ones that pride themselves on their frugality. Pride themselves on helping the poor because they're like, you, you took something extravagant and you just wasted it. We could have sold that and helped however many other people, right? And they missed, they missed what she was actually doing. They were so focused on the logistics and the nuts and the bolts of the cost and what it could have been used for, what it should have been in their mind used for. They missed the beauty of the whole situation. Because see, what she is doing, on one hand, appears to them to be quite reckless. Took something of, of great value and you just ruined the jar and dumped it out. But she's doing something really significant. And in the midst of their complaining, they missed it. And so, Jesus redirects them. Verse 6, Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a good service for me. So he views what she's done as a service. For you will always have the poor with you, and you can do good for them whenever you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. It sounds like the lady with the, the, the widow's might, right? She did what she could. She anointed my body beforehand for burial. And I tell you the truth, whenever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And you and I are reading it today, right? So what she did was more than some kind of reckless gift, more than some reckless breaking of, of it and like just throwing oil out, however, right? She was doing something really important. The, the ones who were complaining about what she did, they missed it, but Jesus told them the beauty of what she's doing. She was anointing him. She was anointing him both as king and also for burial, See, what's interesting is the part of the burial process is the anointing with oils to help preserve and the body and all this part of the process of what they did. And we're actually going to get that again later after he dies when the ladies go and take and they, they, they want to take his body out to then anoint it, but it, they can't, right? So we're going to get that, come back again later. But what's also happening is she's anointing him as king. See, one of the habits the Jewish tradition had is when a king was crowned, they didn't actually get a crown. They were anointed with oil. And the aroma that came from the oil acted like a crown that would follow them around. They, they would smell kingly. And so as a king lived his life going about, he had a smell, the smell of royalty. And what she is doing is she is anointing him as king as well as preparing him for burial. The word Messiah comes from the word Christ, which means the anointed one. So she is doing exactly what should have been expected if you believed he was Messiah. She is anointing him as such. And we also need to remember that then now from this point on, and of course we know he's going to die just in a few short hours, but even if, if we didn't know that and we just knew, but now till whenever it is he bathes really well next, he's going to smell like a king. And everywhere he goes, the people around him are going to smell that of a king. You see how all of these things from the last few days are lining up, right? The entrance of a king, taking his authority, now smelling like a king. He, he has the aroma of a king, and it, that itself sends a statement wherever it is he's present. You and I, we all know somebody who, who wears perfume really strong, right? And like you know they are in the room before you see them. That's what this is. People would have smelled him and been like, is, there, is that... Is that the king? Even before he was there, he would have had that aroma as his crown over the next few hours. And so what she has done here is really beautiful. She is all in and declaring who she believes he is. And we know the story that that is who he is, of crowning him and anointing him as Messiah, preparing him for what is about to come for his burial, which he just alluded to, you noticed, and nobody asked about it. Nobody was like, wait a second, you're going to be buried soon? 
nobody noticed. Even though he's been leading them up to this point, nobody noticed. And so what she has done is, is incredibly beautiful. And then Paul comes in verse 10 and 11. He gives us another side note, a kind of narrative note that no one else here knows, but we, the reader, know. <clears throat> and that is that Judas, one of the 12, has conspired with the chief priests. We know their commitment. We just were told that before has, has increased. And now they have an accomplice. They have an insider, a mole, who's going to help them with what they want to see done. And we get this side note, and like I say, nobody else in the scene knows this, right? But then we turn to verse 12. And we see how this gets dropped into this scene here in a moment, and the tension builds. So verse 12 has a lot for us we need to unpack. It says, now, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed... Jesus' disciples said to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Okay, now let's talk about several things here. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread that, that's, that's happening here. And then we have um, the Passover as well. So these are two festivals that both occur in the Jewish calendar every single year. And they actually fall on top of each other, okay? They're two separate things celebrated in similar ways that fall on top of each other. So the, the festival of unleavened bread is a week in which they eat bread with no leavening in it, no yeast in it. So it's, it's flat bread, right? What we call matzah bread. Um, not very tasty, not very exciting. They didn't like it either, okay? It isn't like they had different taste buds than we did. Um, it, it's just unique bread, right? It's very flat. It has, it's very dense. It has kind of a dry texture to it. There's no, nothing that has made it rise and kind of fluff up and be palatable. And their reasoning is that for them, the, the leavening or the yeast um, caused puffiness in the bread in the same way that sin and hypocrisy and pride do in us. That just in the same way that it puffs up the bread, it puffs up us. And so they made this, this sacrifice for a week of having none of it in their bread so that they would taste kind of this humble bread, if you will, reminding them of their need for humility as well. They're reminding them of, of their, their, their pridefulness and their sin, and this is a week of sort of being reminded of that so they would be humbled and refocus on life and where they maybe fall short and need to make adjustments in their life. Now, we, we sort of do similar things to this, right? If you, if you do the, the whole Lent thing where you give up something for 40 days and most people make it something they don't do anyway, Right? Like, I gave up going to the beach this year for 40 days. <laughs> Didn't happen, who'd have thought, right? But it's, it's supposed to be the similar idea. But it's, it's, it's just a little different. For them, it's seven days, not 40 days, right? And so the other thing is, is yeast is actually an enzyme, right, that, that breaks down the bread over time. If you just let it sit out, it breaks down the bread. And it, it also represents, as we're going to see in the, the unleavening uh, festival and in the Passover festival, that Jesus has no sin. He has nothing that is within him that is decaying, so to speak, in terms of the spiritual side of things. And so this is a representative of who Messiah will be, that this unleavened bread does. And so they celebrate this festival for a week. And this festival begins in the month of Nisan. It's not a car, it's a month on the 14th day. And the Passover happens on Nisan 15. Now here's where it gets confusing, so hang on for a second. You and I, we magically turn our calendars at midnight, right? Midnight happens and we turn from one day to the next. They didn't turn their calendars at midnight, they turned them at sunset. So whenever the sun set, it's now tomorrow, even though for you and I it's still today, right? So the feast, or the, the, yeah, the fest, feast of unleavened bread is on Nisan 14 from sunset all the way around till sunset the next day. And then the, that sunset that night is when the Passover feast happens. And so the same day in you and I's mind, the same day that, it's, that one starts, the other happens that evening. But for them, it's two different days. Okay, does that make sense? 
Okay, so that can be a little confusing, but that, that is how it works in their calendar, that the Passover feast sort of kicks off the festival of unleavening bread that goes for seven days, but the fa- pa- Passover feast just happens that evening. So we have to kind of shift our mind here as we read through this passage to understand that um, this is really, in our mind, the same day. Just two different parts of the same day, but in their mind, it's two different days. Okay, so where are we here? Uh, verse 12. Okay, so we see them. Here they are. They're, they're getting ready to prepare. They're saying this is preparation day. This is the day the unleavened bread starts. We're preparing for the Passover feast, which is tonight, tomorrow. And so, hey, Jesus, what do you want us to do to get ready for this? Okay, legitimate question. They all would have been expecting to celebrate this. Everybody in town was. That's why they were here. So legitimate question. So his response, verse 13, he sent two of his disciples and told them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him wherever he enters. Tell the owner of the house. The teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples left, went into the city and found things just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. Now, do you remember another story we've talked about in the last few weeks very similar to this? The cult, right? Where Jesus took his disciples aside and said, hey, go ahead of me. Here's exactly what you're going to find to be. and, And here's what you do with it when you find it. And sure enough, voila, that's exactly how it happened, right? He has this all planned. He, he in, in his like, infinite knowledge and, and understanding of everything, has all this planned. He, he knows exactly what's going to be and how it's all going to set up. He is in complete control of this situation. And so sure enough, it says they went into the city and found it exactly as they'd planned. And so here they are. They're, they're heading in, and they, they, they find this person. They go. They find the room. It's furnished, meaning it probably had the table and the different furniture and things they needed to, to provide this meal, and, and there it is. They're, they're, they, they know where to go prepare. Now, the Passover celebration is a really important celebration that they're celebrating. We need to understand here about it, and I wish I had even more time. I thought about like totally taking this a different direction and going deep into the weeds of the Passover, and I just decided not to. Um, I do hope next year that we can have the Jews for Jesus back for Good Friday. We had them, oh, several years ago, and they give like a super in-depth explanation of the Passover meal and Jesus and how it all fits together, and it's really stunning. Stunning. But I, I can't, can't do that today, so I decided not to do that. We'll do it next year. Um, and, but we have to understand the Passover story to see what's happening here. And so the, the Passover meal is a celebration that tells the story of the Jewish people from Abraham to the Exodus. And so there are elements involved in the meal and a liturgy that goes along with it that as they eat of this meal, it tells the story of their people. They would retell the story and almost in their minds and spiritually relive their own history of what what was happening and how God was faithful to them in the past and how they know that in this hope projected forward of a Messiah of how they know God will be faithful in the future. So for them, this meal was deeply spiritual, deeply historic, deeply ingrained in their culture. Every person would have done this every year of their entire lives. They never would have missed it at all. And so in what we're going to see as Jesus walks through this, and if you really go dive deep, you can do a Google search if you want on it and see it, but if you really dive deep into the Passover meal, you see that every element of it points to Jesus, this messianic hope that he fulfills. And so the Passover is laden with these expectations and these prophetic looks both backwards and forwards of how God saved the Hebrew people. And Jesus is going to use this setting, this meal, as a way of explaining who he is. And so this goes so deep for the Hebrew people, that um, they even, expecting this Messiah to come, they even, as part of the meal every year, a young child goes to the front door, opens it, and hollers out for Elijah, expecting him to be there, because they fully believe the Messiah will come and Elijah will be the forerunner. We talked about that a few weeks ago, right? And so they, they fully expect that we ought to go check and just make sure to see if Elijah's here, right? That's how much hope it means for them. 
uh, as, they, as they think about what they're celebrating in the past and looking forward. A word you might hear around Passover is a word called Seder. The word Seder just means order, meaning an order of things. And so there was, there was an order in which they did things. It was very structured. There's 15 steps that they go through. Some of the steps are, are quite extensive, like eating lamb stew. Some of it is much more simple, like they have bitter herbs. And I was reading about this, and, and what this is is like ground up dried horseradish that you dip in with like lettuce and eat it straight. And the point is to make you cry because of what it symbolizes, the bitterness of who we are and what it is we need in a savior. And so like the point of it is to be just terrible, right? So there's these different elements in these 15 steps that all have these deep meanings that they celebrate as they eat. So I mentioned the lamb stew. That's part of what they do is they they sacrifice a lamb. You notice here in verse um, 12, they mention the the, the Passover lamb that's sacrificed. So what they would have done as part of the preparation is taken a young lamb to the, um, the temple sacrificed, gone through the process of the, made the ceremonial sacrifice, and then brought the, the dead lamb back home and then prepared it and cooked it for the meal that night. That's a lot of work, right? So that's part of what they would have done. So they would have had this lamb stew. Another part of what they would have done is there were four glasses of wine that they would have drank throughout the, the, the whole meal. And so there's like, you eat a little bit and drink a little bit and eat a little bit and drink a little bit. And after you eat the horseradish, you have to drink some wine because that's the only way you're going to survive the rest of it, right? And so like, there's this process that they go through that's very laid out, very ordered, all has these deep meanings. This meal would have taken two to three hours to complete, starting at sunset. Okay, and this would have been in April, so about this time of year. So you picture, I think sunset tonight is at 8.14. And so if you picture starting this at 8.15 tonight, going we into the night with this meal, right? Okay, and so they would have been there. And so let's just picture for a moment this day, Nissan 14, what preparation looks like for this meal. We know there's at least, what? A dozen plus people there. Who knows how many more people? But we know at least the twelve and Jesus. But there's probably a few more. Let's say, let's let's just say twenty people. What would it have been like to be in the first century, walking everywhere? There's no refrigerators to where you could have made something a week early and kept it. You're going today to gather all of this, all of these herbs, the lamb, the whole deal, to get it ready. To whatever decorations they would have done to the room, to be ready for this meal. At sunset, this would have been a very long and tiring and busy day. But that's what they're doing. And he sent them, and it was exactly as, as he said it would be. Okay, And they got it all ready. And so now verse 17, <clears throat> when it was evening, meaning that sun had set, it's the next day, it's 8, 15, 9 o'clock at night, he came to the house with the 12. While they were at the table eating, Jesus said... I tell you the truth, one of you eating with me will betray me. Talk about a showstopper. Talk about like just throwing a hand grenade in the middle of the, of the meal and just bringing everything to a cre- screeching halt. We have to understand that these 12, remember he describes them not just as friends, but as his family. Remember when his mom comes And they say, hey, your family's outside. He goes, this is my family. Now, he wasn't insulting her, right? He's speaking to the depth of the relationships of these people. So he's he's not just saying, hey, somebody is going to betray me. He's saying one of these people, one of these family to me is going to betray me, is going to turn their back. And we can see from their response, this wasn't received well. Verse 19, they say, they were distressed. And one by one, they said, surely not me. <clears throat> it's, not, it's not me, is it? And he said to them, it's one of the 12 who dips his hand with me in the bowl. Now, just so you know, like I pictured this for a long time until I really read about the Seder. I pictured this as like, you know, they're passing the carrots and two of us reach into the bowl at the same time. And there was like this look of like, uh-oh. Is it you, right? That's what I pictured. That's not what happened, okay? I know. It would have been great, but it's not what happened because they could have figured it out. Anyway, so part of the Seder meal was so the elements were in bowls, these little bowls that would hold like the spices of whatever. And so what he's saying is like, 
you all that are sharing in this Seder meal, it's one of you. It's one of you that are here, one of the, those that are closest with me that are sharing this very personal meal with me. It's one of you. And so, uh, let's see, verse 21. For the Son of Man will go as it is written about him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for him to have never been born. Can you imagine being Judas at this moment? Uh-oh. But he follows through with it. So he must not have been that convicted, right? But can you imagine being him in this room hearing this happen? Now, there's a little bit of irony here because we know there's Judas. They just knew it was one of them. We also know what's going to happen with Peter with his three denials. We also know what's going to happen with all 12 of them, that once he's arrested and things get serious, they scatter. So in a way, they all abandon him. Now, Judas clearly is who he's talking about, but the irony is, is all of them are saying, is it me, hoping it's not me. And in the end, in a, in a way, it is. It's all of them. All of them scattered when the time came. And so verse 22, while they were eating, so at some point in the midst of this meal, he took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take it. This is my body. Now, this is interesting. Um, that bread was a major part of this meal. And remember, it's unleavened bread, right? Bread was a major part of this meal. It comes into play several times throughout the meal. But there is this one part of the meal that's, I think, important and is intriguing. And most people believe this is what he actually was doing. That it wasn't that just, hey, it's time to eat the bread now. So, hey, guys, here's this bread. This is my body. I, most people don't believe that's what happened. There's part of the Seder meal where they take a piece of bread ahead of time and they break it off and they hide it. Now, hide it is a relic. Like they put it under a, under a towel off to the side. And at one point in the meal, it is revealed it is brought out like, hey, here's the piece of bread I hid earlier, right? And it has a special meaning because it is meant to symbolize the Messiah, the one who has been hidden and at some point will be revealed, okay? So that's the symbolism in, in the Seder meal. And so it's believed that he takes this piece of bread and he brings it out, this bread that represents the Messiah and says, this is me. This is me. This is my body. Now, it's one thing to say this is me. It's another thing to say this is my body, right? Because he's, he's really pointing quite, quite make, like a much more intimate connection. This isn't just, hey, this represents me. Here I am. But he's saying, like, this is my body. And, of course, we know in some of the translations he says, which is broken for you, right? And so he's, he's making this clear picture, this clear connection of himself being the Messiah with this revealed bread, but he's also painting this picture of him and what he is going to do and his sacrifice for them as Messiah. He's continuing to redefine who Messiah is, whom they had pictured and were expecting and whom he actually is. Saying that this is him and he is going to give of himself. He is going to allow his body to be broken on their behalf to pay for their sins. He's going to be the sacrifice. There's some um, commentators who have noticed that in all four of the accounts of the Passover meal in, in the Gospels, there is no lamb mentioned. In a traditional meal, there should have been. And some would say there, there was, it just wasn't mentioned. But some say, no, there isn't a lamb mentioned. And the reason why is because he intentionally told them not to do a lamb because he is the lamb. Now, that's conjecture, and like I say, different scholars disagree on that, but I think that's interesting how he, he is pointing to who he is, that he is this lamb. He is going to be the one who is broken. His body is what's going to be broken as payment for us in the same way that Messiah was the one coming back to save and to rescue, that that is me, and I'm going to give of my body to do this. And so in the middle of the meal, this happens. In the middle of these steps, in the middle of this Seder, this piece of bread is brought out. And then in verse 23, it says, After taking the cup, 
and giving thanks. Now, if you were to read like in Matthew's gospel, it says after the meal. It, it isn't like after, like bread first, after his cup. It's more like afterwards, the later parts of the meal. There's a cup. He takes the cup and he gives thanks. And he gave it to them and they drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood, the blood of the covenant that is poured out for many. Now he's really kind of making some waves here. He took the bread and said, this is my body. And now he's taking the wine and saying, this is my blood. He's making some very personal, intimate connections into these elements and, and very graphic, right? Now in the Seder, in the 15 steps, the last two steps have the last two glasses of wine. And so it makes sense that it was one of these last glasses of wine. And that as they were at the end of their meal, that he was holding this up and saying, this, this is me. This is this representation. This is the blood. This is the sacrifice I'm going to make. The, the blood that always comes from a sacrifice. The blood that sort of seals the sacrifice. This represents that. Me and the sacrifice I am going to be making. He's making this very clear connection to this new covenant, this new relationship that we now will have, this agreement, so to speak, between us and him, and that is of grace through him, through his sacrifice, through his blood, and through his body. This represents this, this new relationship of grace, meaning we're not perfect. He loves us unconditionally, and we can, we can live with the freedom of grace of his love and its commitment to us. That is this new covenant. And of course, both of these, the breaking of the bread and the, and the wine, the, the blood, all are pointing forward to his death, which they don't understand how quickly it's going to happen. Right? I mean, we're just hours away. But he knows exactly what he's pointing to. And he, he ends it saying, I tell you the truth, I will no longer drink of this fruit the end, this is immediate. This is happening quickly. I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it in the new king. I'm sorry, drink it new in the kingdom of God. And after singing a hymn, which is the very last step of the of the uh, seder, they went out to the Mount of Olives. We get a little insert about Peter, and then we get to the garden where he and his three guy buddies are sleeping. Right. So I want us quickly, just to come back to the question, why are the three guys sleeping? They've had an exhausting day where they've run all over the city. They've made a huge meal. They've decorated for a huge group of people. And they just had a 15-course meal, including heavy food like stew, lamb stew and four glasses of wine. And now it's after midnight. That's why they're asleep. <laughs> I'd be asleep too. It isn't that they uh, don't care. It isn't that they're not committed. It's the natural result of a really, really big day. And it now being the wee hours of the morning. And four glasses of wine. <laughs> and they're asleep. And so we, we get to Gethsemane. And we're going to pick up from here what happens on Friday night. I encourage you to be here, 7 o'clock Friday evening. Because that's where we're going to start. And how things now play out. In the, in the hours following that. But as we close here, um, normally we do communion the first Sunday of each month. We didn't do that last week because of today. So we're going to take communion now. Gentlemen, you can go ahead and um, pass out to the elements. And as they're doing so, I want us to wrap back through and remind ourselves of what is happening here, what this passage just taught us. Okay, and by the way, um, we practice open communion, meaning you don't have to be a member of our church. If you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are welcome to, to partake with us. There's two glasses on top of each other. Don't let that confuse you. The bread is underneath and the, the, the juice is on top. So make sure you grab both and be careful. Okay, so let's review here for a second as we're passing these out. There's only one other time that Jesus himself explains his death. 
Now, we get lots of explanation from Paul and such afterwards, but only one other time does Jesus really even attempt to explain his death when he describes it as a ransom for many. And so here we have this critical point in his life where he knows it's ending quickly and he is trying to explain to them what it is that he is just about to do. And they don't realize it, but he is. And of all the ways he could use to define for them, to describe for them, to explain for them his death, he chooses an object lesson of the Passover. He chooses something that was ingrained into their lives for over a thousand years, that had been uh, this thing that everybody had done for all these years. They knew what every single element had done. It had been very intentional, very set aside, very sacred for so long. And he uses it to tell the story. He uses it to explain. He takes this practice that was woven into every part of their lives, and he reshapes it to tell his story, to see how his story is connected with that story. To take, just like we've seen before, and if you remember from from the the Sermon on the Mount, to take these Old Testament laws that they knew of as this, and he gives it this much more depth, right? Showing how it's actually this and expands out. And so he he takes this, he takes this, this tradition that they had that for them was them participating in their past, them participating in the future, them kind of reliving and becoming a part of the story of their people every year. And he says, I want you to now be a part of the story and see how I connect in with the story, see how this story is really about me. They celebrated every year, and it was an intensely personal celebration. And I believe that that now, from this time, when, when he commands us to do this often, that he's wanting us to participate in the story too. Just as they felt like this, doing the the Passover Seder, was them participating in who they were as people, that we allow this to help define who we are as people. The world loves to define us for us, but he shows us who he is, and we are people of him. We are people of the king, of the kingdom. And when we do this, We are to be doing so, understanding that we are are participating in this, that we are one of his people, that this story is our story. And that that should resonate deeply with us, of understanding who we are and our faith and, and, and what we believe and who he was and who we believe in. And so... Now that we have the elements, I want us to take just a moment <clears throat> to reflect on this story and to reflect upon you and I and our place in this story as one of his people, as a follower of him or someone who proclaims him as the king. And I just want us to take a moment to relish our identity in this story. So take a moment. So we hold these elements and we look at this piece of bread and we we remember what it represents, right? The coming Messiah, his body that he broke for us. So as we eat, we are accepting, we are embracing the blessing that this is. We're claiming it for ourselves and our part of the story that this links us to eat with me. The same way we hold the cup. And we, we consider what the cup means, right? This covenant, this relationship we have with him. 
And we can, can, we can believe the lies of Satan and of the world that our relationship with God is any number of different things, right? But he says, no, this is my blood that I shed for you, and our relationship is one of grace. Our covenant is one of grace. And we're part of that story. Our identity is in that, not in whatever else we're told. So as we drink, again, we're claiming that blessing for ourselves. Would you drink with me? Father, um, once again, I love the beauty of the story. I love the beauty of, of teaching in a way that is far beyond words. And I, I don't, don't know that I did an adequate job this morning because I feel like that the depth and the, uh, the beauty of this passage, this Passover, and how all of this comes together is, is uh, far beyond um, what we can really grasp, but it's beautiful. And in doing this today, Father, we proclaim Jesus as the King. I pray that our lives would reflect that, that like the lady with the jar, we would be all in. We wouldn't be screwing the lid off the jar of our life, hoping that we can just dip a little oil out and save it for something more. But we'd be smashing it. And we'd be fully committed because we recognize who you are, just as she did. And so, Father, I pray that as we have taken of this today, it would be revealing ourselves to us. We'd see where maybe we've fallen short, where we're not, um, we're not following well, where we're not believing in you in this area or that area of our life, and that that would grieve us. We would repent of that, and we would come back to this place, to the, the bread and the cup, back to who we are in you. So, Father, thank you for all of this, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.